Welcome to Dermatology Explained. Today's video presentation is a continuation of our series on autoimmune bullous diseases. Part two, we are focusing on pemphigus vulgaris. Firstly, we'll start off with a recap of the anatomical level of split that we need to understand when considering autoimmune blistering disorders. The blister may form in any one of the following different levels. This includes intraepidermal split and subepidermal split. Within the intraepidermal group, the blister may appear in the subcorneal level, in the spinous or malpigian layers, or in the suprabasilar level, just above the dermal epidermal junction. Blisters can also form in the subepidermal layer. The different levels of blisters correspond to the different molecular proteins that are targeted in the autoimmune condition. For example, if a patient has a condition with an autoimmune antibody against a target antigen that is in the upper epidermis, then therefore the blister will occur in the intraepidermal or subcorneal levels. What are the pemphigus blistering diseases? Pemphigus is characterized by intraepidermal split, that is, a blister that forms in the upper layer of the skin. Pemphigus is derived from the Greek word pemphix, which means blister or bubble. It can be categorized into six groups, pemphigus vulgaris, pemphigus foliaceus, IgA pemphigus, drug-induced pemphigus, paraneoplastic pemphigus, and hepatiform pemphigus. Today's video presentation is focused on pemphigus vulgaris. There is a reactive variant form, which is known as pemphigus vegetans. In terms of pemphigus foliaceus, there are two variants, including the endemic form, also known as folo salvagem, as well as a lupus-like variant, also known as pemphigus erythromatosis. In order to understand the molecular nature of pemphigus vulgaris, let's remind ourselves about the different proteins in the junctions that are available at different levels of the skin. On the diagram on the left is a schematic presentation of human skin, depicting the targets of autoantibodies in autoimmune bullous dermatoses. On the top layer of the skin and in the top circle, we can see the close-up of the antigenic structural components of desmosomes, which connect the cytoskeletons of neighboring skin cells known as keratinocytes. These desmosomes are made up of subproteins called desmoglobin 1, desmoglobin 3, as well as desmocolin, placoglobin, and periplacon. It is desmo1, desmoglobin 1 and 3, which are the targets involved in pemphigus vulgaris as well as pemphigus foliaceus. Pemphigus vulgaris predominantly affects desmoglobin 3 which is present towards the middle and lower half of the upper layer of the epidermis, whereas pemphigus foliaceus tends to affect desmoglobin 1, which is typically found in the upper layer of the upper epidermis, and hence the split with pemphigus foliaceus tends to be subcorneal. Pemphigus vulgaris is an autoimmune blistering disorder. It is characterized by lesions on the skin as well as the mucosal surfaces, including the mouth. It affects people of all races, age, and sex. It may be more common in Ashkenazi Jews, Indians, and East Asians. It is associated with a number of other comorbidities, including infection, trauma, autoimmune problems such as myasthenia gravis, lupus erythromatosis, as well as malignancy such as thymoma and Castleman's tumor, which is paraneoplastic. In terms of the underlying pathophysiology of pemphigus vulgaris, it involves immunoglobulin type G IgG autoantibodies that bind a protein called desmoglobin 3, which is one of the components of the desmosomes, which form the interconnection between keratinocytes. Their binding causes keratinocytes to separate and be replaced by fluid, which forms a blister in the intraepidermal level. 50% of patients with pemphigus vulgaris also have anti desmoglobin 1 antibodies. In oral-only involvement, pemphigus vulgaris, the target is usually only desmoglobin 3, whereas in mucocutaneous pemphigus vulgaris, the targets include both desmoglobin 3 and desmoglobin 1. In terms of the explanation for the localization of blist formation, whether it involves oral cavity only or mucocutaneous presentation, 
These variations can be explained by the Desmodet compensation theory, and this will be the focus of another separate video in this video series on autoimmune bullous disorders. This diagram just re-demonstrates how the blister forms in Pervigus vulgaris. As already stated, in this condition, there is autoantibodies against predominantly desmoglein 3, but also desmoglein 1, which are the components of the desmosomes, which are the bridges which connect the keratinocytes. When these autoantibodies bind to these desmoglanes, it causes these keratinocyte cells to separate, and fluid can then form in between and separate these cells further, which then lead to a blister. In terms of clinical features of pemphigus vulgaris, as already mentioned, there are two predominant groups. One is mucosal only presentation, whereas the second group involves both mucosal as well as cutaneous presentation. All pemphigus vulgaris cases usually involves some sort of mucosal lesions, most commonly in their mouth, including the buccal surfaces and the palatine surfaces, which can impact oral intake. It can also extend to the vermilion lip and result in hemorrhagic crusting. Oral Presentation occurs in 50 to 70% of the time, but it may be the only presentation. Intact bullae are quite rare. They're usually ill-defined, irregularly shaped in the buccal or palatal areas, forming erosions which are slow to heal. Other mucosal surfaces that can be involved include the conjunctiva, the nasal areas, the pharynx, the larynx, the esophagus, urethra, vulva, and cer cervix. The diagnosis of pemphigus vulgaris tends to be delayed in patients when patients present with only oral involvement as compared to patients who present with skin lesions. Here are some images demonstrating some mucosal involvement by pemphigus vulgaris. On the left and middle sections, we can see oral and lip involvement, whereas on the right-hand side, we can see the conjunctiva as well as the nasal orifices, which are involved by pemphigus vulgaris lesions which form bullae, which can partly erode and lead to crusting. In terms of cutaneous clinical features of pemphigus vulgaris, the primary lesions are predominantly flaccid, thin-walled, and easily ruptured, blistered. They can appear anywhere on the skin surface, but usually arise on normal pairing skin or erythematous spaces. The fluid within the bullae is initially clear. However, they can become more hemorrhagic, turbid, or even seropurinant. The blisters are fragile and soon rupture to form painful erosions that ooze and bleed easily. These erosions can attain a large size and can become generalized. The erosions soon become partially covered with crusts that have little or no tendency to heal. Those lesions that do heal often leave hyperpigmented patches with no scarring. Associated pruritus is uncommon. The lesions demonstrate Nikolsky positive sign as well as Absar Hansen positive sign. Without treatment, this condition can be fatal due to fluid loss and sepsis. The areas affected predominantly involve the scalp, the face, the axilla, the groin, and pressure points. There have also been reports of nail involvement by Pemphigus vulgaris, and this can include nail dystrophy, acute paronychia, and subungal hematomas. Here are some images demonstrating some of these findings. One rare variant of Pemphigus vulgaris is Pemphigus vegetans. This is characterized by flaccid blisters that become erosions and then form fungoid vegetations or papillomatous proliferations, particularly in the intertriginous areas and on the scalp or face. Pustules rather than vesicles characterize early lesions, but these soon progress to form vegetative plaques. The tongue may also show cerebriform like changes. There are two subtypes that are recognized for pemphigus vegetans. This includes the more severe form of Newman and a more mild form of Halepu. Here are some images demonstrating pemphigus vegetans involving the perineal area as well as intertriginous areas. In terms of investigations for pemphigus vulgaris, a skin biopsy should be performed. This demonstrates suprabasal acanthalysis and clefting. That is, the split occurs in the epidermis just above the basal keratinocyte layer. The basal cells remain attached to the basement membrane, but separate from one, one another, demonstrating a classic appearance of row of tombstones on histology. 
The blister cavity contains some acantholytic cells. There may also be some mild superficial mixed inflammatory infiltrate with some eosinophils as well. Direct immunofluorescence often demonstrates IgG on keratinocytes throughout the epidermis in a chicken wiring pattern. The staining may be more significant on the lower aspect of the epidermis. Here is a histological slide demonstrating suprabasal acantholysis. That is a level of split that is above the basal layer, which results from a loss of intercellular adhesion between keratinocytes. This causes a blister just above the basal layer. The basal keratinocytes remain attached to the basement membrane zone via the hemidermosomes, but lose attachment to one another. We can see here the characteristic row of tombstone appearance. The blisters in Pemphigus vulgaris are usually non-inflammatory. However, neutrophils and eosinophils can be present within and around the blister cavity. Here are some images of immunofluorescence findings associated with Pemphigus vulgaris. We can see here on the top slide, IgG autoantibodies directed against the keratinocytes as demonstrated by fluorescence from anti-desmogline 3 IgG. In the image below, we can see Pemphigus vulgaris sera containing both anti-desmogline 3 and anti-desmogline 1 autoantibodies stain the whole epidermis throughout. Some other investigations to consider include indirect immunofluorescence, which demonstrates autoantibodies in over 80% of cases, However, this is not a specific test. It can be positive in some other conditions, including burns, toxic epidermal necrolysis, penicillin reactions, and staph scalded skin syndrome. However, it can help in guiding the dose of steroids in terms of determining whether the disease is improving or not. ELISA testing may be more sensitive. Greater than 95% of cases will have positive testing for desmoglein 3 autoantibodies or antibodies and 50% desmoglein 1. Zinc smear from the base of the blister or oral erosion may show acantholytic cells. It is also important to consider a, malig a malignancy screen, given that Pemphigus vulgaris has associations with a number of malignancies, including thymoma and Hasselman's disease. In terms of management, the initial step is to explain the diagnosis. That Pemphigus vulgaris may be due to a genetic predisposition or triggering factor that is unclear but could be infective in nature. The underlying pathophysiology involves autoantibodies against an antigen on the surface of the keratinocytes. This is usually desmoglein 3 for oral and mucosal lesions and desmoglein 1 for skin lesions. The associated mortality ranges from 5 to 15 percent, with the main cause being opportunistic infections. The disease activity generally decreases with time. Most relapses occur in the first two years after diagnosis. In terms of the treatment options for Pemphigus vulgaris, usually for localized disease, potent topical or intralesional corticosteroids are considered. For oral lesions or mucosal surface involvement, oral anesthetics and oral antifungal medications, as well as oral steroid washes, should be considered. Systemic treatment with oral prednisone from a dose that ranges 1 to 1.5 mg per kilogram per day, and then wean and maintain is the, is the initial treatment of choice. In some more severe cases, this may require intravenous pulse methylprednisone. Once there is some control with oral steroid, one should then consider switch to steroid sparing agents. There are several different agents of choice, including azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, microphenolate, mofetil, Dapsone, methotrexate, and tetracyclines and nicotinamide. There is increasing evidence of the use of rituximab as the steroid sparing agent of choice. And indeed, some guidelines have recommended rituximab as the first choice in these instances. And there is also reports of other treatment options, including plasmapheresis, ECP, IVIG, infliximab, and etanercept. This is a table from a textbook demonstrating the treatment ladder for Pemphigus vulgaris as Reiterated, the standard initial treatment of choice is oral prednisone, and then consideration of a switch to a steroid sparing agent with increasing evidence indicating rituximab as the first choice. However, traditionally, alternative steroid sparing agents have included azathioprine, microphenolate, mofetil, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, plasmapheresis, IVIG, and ECP. This is a flow chart from UpToDate, which demonstrates that 
rituximab should be considered as the first line steroid sparing agent once there is some control with oral systemic prednisone. Thank you for joining us on this video presentation today. I hope you've learned something interesting about Pemphigus vulgaris. We're excited to see you at the next video. Thank you.